The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. This is an opinion-based program. This is Other Than a 24. Tonight, after last week's episode on election policy and strategies, this week we are closing in on the candidates themselves. The Sri Lanka Podjana Peramuna has finally come up with a candidate they think the whole island is seeking, while the United National Party is still in shambles trying to figure out as to who will lead them in this year's presidential battle. Can the new and improved Sajid Premadasa win the nomination over the party's stalwart and incumbent leader Ranil Wickremesinghe or will the UNPC minority opt for a third candidate that supersedes both top guns or will the election be a three-way horse race with incumbent president throwing his name to the ring whoever the candidates may be what are their policies and more importantly what is their vision for this nation will they able to shape us up as a nation of doers or will we be shaped into a nation of beggars? Tonight, joining me for insight and analysis of their candidates are Eramda Ginige, who is a social entrepreneur and member of the We Are Mother Initiative and have been following the campaign of the Pudujana Peramuna, and Rasika Jayakodi, a political analyst and the former editor of Daily News. Welcome to Monday. It's time to get real. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the program. I'm Mahesh Johnny. This week, we continue our Election Watch 2019 and focusing on the candidates and their vision for this country. In my opening statement this evening, last week, as you remember, we managed to discuss as to what type of policies, strategies and discussions we need to be privy when selecting our candidates for the upcoming presidential election. Well, one party has put forward a candidate who they think can whip the support of the masses to win the top job of this nation, which is Mr. Gotabe Rajpaksa from the Sri Lanka Pudduchana Peramuna. And the other, well, we're still waiting to see as to who that might be from the United National Party. Take a look at this cartoon from our sister newspaper, The Morning, which absolutely explains the situation at the UNP. The so-called unity, strength and whatnot portrayed by the United National Party was washed away when an existing Cold War between the current leader of the UNP, Prime Minister Ronald Wickremesinghe, and its deputy leader, Sajid Premadasa, openly clashed during the previous working committee meeting with regard to the new constitution that had love to form a new alliance for the upcoming election. It seems like the PM himself isn't just planning to go without a fight, as this election would indeed be his last for this top job. He's currently 70 years old, and when the next one comes, he will be around 75. So it seems that he's giving a good fight to ensure that he can carry the nomination and the party to victory this time. However, there's a possibility of a dark horse that can enter the race. It's none other than the incumbent president, Maitri Pala Sirisena. He hasn't confirmed to anyone as to whether he's running, but the SLPP having their own plans and the UNP too shying away from the common candidate theme after they got burned back in 2015, President Sirisena's chances of winning seems to be thinning. If he puts his name into the hat, this election will be shaped up to be a three-way split. Now, that is no good for anyone, because to win the presidential election, you need to have 50% and one vote. In the previous election, President Sirisen only managed a mere 51.28%, indicating that in the upcoming election, it's quite vital that the candidate must garner the support of the new votes, mainly the younger generation that is entering the voting bloc. Now, Dani Dovitanavasam from our team went onto the streets to get an idea as to where people stand in this three-way race. Thank you, Mahesh. Today we are in the streets of Colombo to do a small litmus test as to what the public's opinion is with regards to the presidential election. We should bear in mind that this is not a scientific analysis of the public's opinion, but rather what their weaves are of the candidates that are slowly crystallizing on the election platform. The question we asked was quite simple. Is it Minister Sajid Premadasa, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha, Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe, or President Maitripala Sirisena, who would they vote for in the upcoming presidential election? This is what we heard. 
this case, I would like to uh, choose uh, Gotabe Rajapaksha. Uh, thing is because uh, I supported Ranil Vikramasinghe earlier and I voted for Ranil Vikramasinghe. Actually, the thing is, ultimately, they couldn't apprehend uh, wrong, wrong doors. Sajid Premadas. Actually, I prefer uh, Sajid Premadas uh, among them. I like to the Gotabe Rajapaksha. Gotabe Rajapaksha. Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha, definitely. <laughs> Sajid Premadas. Discipline uh, number one, uh, Gotabe Rajapaksha. We want security and discipline. I like Go Gotabe Rajapaksha. Uh, sorry, sorry to say, no one. I think uh, it's good that you can put a newer channel for the market, but I prefer someone who's doing the work as uh, which is proven by Mr. Gotabe. So I think it's, he's good. Actually, I think uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha is the best. 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 Let's get more perspective on the subject that we are discussing right now. Uh, joining me uh, are two individuals. Uh, the media seems to be calling them the new breed of politics in Sri Lanka. Uh, it is uh, Eranga Ginige, who is a, a social entrepreneur here in Sri Lanka and has been very active in the political scene very recently. Welcome, uh, Eranga, and also Rasika Jayakodi. Uh, once again, uh, you two, I've been seeing you uh, in most platforms discussing about the current status of politics and it's really nice to see young blood coming uh, in front and taking uh, the helm. So uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining uh, this show. Um, we are discussing about the candidates. The Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna has now come up with Gotabe Rajapaks as their candidate and the United National Party is yet to mention but there are a few names uh, that is being thrown uh, around so we will get uh, to them in a moment. I'll start with you, uh, Aranga, since we know who the candidate of the Sri Lanka Padujana Pirman, the SLPP, Gotabe Rajpaksa. Uh, if I may ask you, in a Gotabe Rajpaksa administration, are we going to see the vision for the country, a Mahinda Chintanaya 2.0, or is this a completely new thing? Mm. Mahesh, thank you very much for having uh, me, and uh, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Well, um, First of all, um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a great feeling um, we have in our camp, uh, as we say, uh, because uh, uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa has, um, has been, although he was, his name was announced uh, yesterday, it has been coming for a very long time, as you know. Uh, the people uh, all over Sri Lanka, of all walks of life, um, had been requesting him to uh, be the presidential candidate of our camp. Uh, and you know, it was a culmination of, of that wish, the people's wish, um, which happened yesterday. So it, it's, you know, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that. Um, but obviously, it's just a start. Uh, there will be a, a candidate uh, and many other candidates uh, from other uh, sides. And we'll see what happens. But um, so to answer your question, I think, um, I think a realistic answer is, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa has um, presented um, a new vision in terms of, of economy um, and, and socio politics, right? And we can talk about that. You know, you know, being very specific, the socialist, market-based economic policy, uh, and so on. And uh, and he very much sort of believes in in republic and equality and and those principles. Um, but I think at the same time. Um, we, we cannot say that it's going to be you know all new because there has been some some amazing some some really good uh, policies during Mahindra Rajapaksa's uh, government and I think it's it's only right that you continue some of those but maybe not all of those because you know I'm sure um, you know uh, people in our camp would have uh, also realized uh, uh, the weaknesses of some of those policies so with those lessons learned with improvement uh, and with the new uh, vision of Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa. I think uh, you know that that's how it's 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 realistically going to be. Indeed, uh, if I turn to you, Rasika, what's happening with the UNP? It's well. an exciting time for the UNP. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, lots of discussions <laughs> taking place, a lot of names being debated. Uh, but I think the UNP will buy more time before announcing the candidate because the election is about four or five months away. Uh, the last presidential election, the election, the candidate's name was announced 
uh, approximately eight weeks before the election. Uh, so UNP will take more time, obviously, and uh, there will be a lot of, I think it's all healthy dialogue, I mean, there are dialogues, ta discussions taking place. Uh, is, is, is that a discussion <coughs> or is it more so of a disagreement? Uh, what we've seen in the news is that the UNP leader, Prime Minister Rani Wickremesinghe and uh, Deputy <coughs> Leader Sajid uh, Premadasa seems to be having a tussle uh, openly now. Uh, is, that, is that good for the party? That's what discussion looks like. I mean, discussions are not smooth all the time, right? There are disagreements, there are conflicts, and there are, uh, you know, differences in opinion. But in the end, politics is all about uh, finding the middle ground. It's out of the possible. So uh, I'm confident that UNP will come up with a final uh, solution, a solution that everyone can, uh, you know, agree upon. Uh, so let's see, I think in my personal opinion, uh, the UNP, uh, UNP's presidential campaign uh, should be driven by a combination. And uh, the party leader, Prime Minister Ranil Vikram Singh, should be the main driving factor in that combination. But he will have to uh, find a suitable partner in terms of, you know, either as his prime minister, prime ministerial candidate, and both of them should drive the campaign, and that's the that should be the strategic direction of the UNP's campaign, in my opinion. So the 19th Amendment being played right now uh, is literally reducing the power of the president. So whoever is coming to power to this particular post is not going to have the exe executive presidency that we saw in the past. Um, so the real power will lie in the parliament with the prime minister. So in that dynamic, uh, who do you see would be the best um, candidates uh, or a candidate? It's like this, uh, Mahesh. Uh, 19th Amendment to the Constitution uh, creates an imperat imperative need for a, for a great balance of power between the President and the Prime Minister. So there has to be a great understanding, a great cooperation between the President and the Prime Minister. Uh, so, I mean, that's the crisis uh, we are seeing right now in Sri exactly. Lanka because the president and the prime minister are not on the same page about many things concerning the governance, right? So, um, when it comes to the UNP and when it comes to selecting candidates, uh, the president and the presidential candidate and the prime ministerial candidate, if they are running together, I mean, elections will take place separately, but if, from a campaign perspective, if they're running together, it's very important that uh, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe selects, a, chooses a candidate that he can work with. Uh, but at the same time, now, answering your question, uh, I don't believe that uh, you know, under the 19th Amendment, the president has been rendered powerless. I mean, president- To a certain extent. Uh, his certain powers, certain excessive powers have been curtailed. But uh, the president still has full authority over the appointment of uh, appointments of uh, minister secretaries who run the administration mm -hmm. uh, in the country, in the state sector, and uh, he has you know full control over the allocation of subjects among ministries. Although he has to uh, appoint uh, ministers based on the recommendations of the prime minister, prime minister, when it comes to the allocation of subjects, he can exercise absolute discretion. Uh, and uh, the president uh, uh, will chair the cabinet. If you read the uh, judgment relating to, uh, which uh, came out in April 2015, mm -hmm. given by Chief Justice Sri Power on the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, it clearly mentions what the president's uh, powers are. I think that uh, offers Indeed. a clear perspective. So I don't buy, uh, I, don't, I don't believe uh, and the notion that the president, uh, presidential has become powerless, president will exercise a certain amount of uh, uh, executive powers have been vested with him. At the same time, there's a need for great cooperation between the president, the prime minister, and the cabinet of ministers. That is, that is, that is very essential. Uh, Aranga, if in a Gotabia Rajpaksa administration, who do you think would be the second in command? Would it be former President Mahindra Rajpaksa, or will we see a new administration forming? Yeah. Well, I mean, the the what we have to understand is that um, the the Prime Minister is selected from the Parliament, right? And there's going to be a separate election for that, right? So uh, that that composition of of that Parliament will depend on on that election, mm -hmm. right? Um, but obviously, we, we believe that uh, you know there's a huge people's uh, uh, wish uh, for uh, uh, for a new uh, government. You know, elect a, a new uh, set of people 
that will become the government side of the parliament. Um, and, you know, for better or worse, what happens is whatever the party or the group or the alliance that gets the highest number of seats in the parliament are the ones that actually make the cabinet of ministers as well, which is actually a bit of an abomination if, uh, you know, in, in terms of the separation of powers. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so, so I think in, in a scenario like that, obviously the most popular uh, a yeah. person is, is Mahindra Rajapaksa and you know he will be undoubtedly the Prime Minister in, in such a scenario. Um, but I think more than sort of uh, you know you know running on expectations like this, I think what we need to understand is that now you know Rasika for example mentioned that the, the President and the Prime Minister needs to have a good understanding uh, among themselves. I, I mean, it's it's a yes and no because what I think is the parliament is essentially the uh, the legislature, right? They make laws. They cannot execute laws. Mm -hmm. To execute laws, you have the executive, right? And the executive is not the president, Mahesh. A lot of the time, people make mistake that when you say executive president, that is the executive. No, executive is is the act of execution. So there are three institutions. The, the presidency, which is an institution, and it's not a person or an individual, and then there's a cabinet of ministers as, the, as part of the executive, and then the public sector, uh, as Rasika mentioned, that you know appointed by uh, uh, the president. So these three institutions collectively form the executive. Now the executive and the legislature need to have a separation uh, between themselves, right? But then the, the problem is that you know because the prime minister also becomes a part of the parliament, and also becomes a part of the executive, then there's a you know a, a, a conflict of, uh, of of powers, conflict of interest, and so on. So I think that that is where the power issue is in the constitution. I think you know we should have a constructive debate on how we can solve such kind of things. But I think it's going to be really interesting uh, to see. Um, a new person like uh, uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa, who has a new vision, uh, who works slightly different from the traditional uh, politicians, um, uh, and and how that's all going to work out with uh, with the parliamentarians. It's going to be uh, uh, an interesting time. I think it's going to be good uh, in terms of of change in the political culture uh, in Sri Lanka. If I turn to you, uh, Rasika. Um, the SLPP cemented their candidate, they're done and dusted with it, now it's the campaign. The UNP is yet to, and we are hearing uh, around four names just being tossed up, Prime Minister Ronnie Wickremesinghe's name, uh, Deputy Leader Sajid Premadasa's name, um, even Karaj Jayasuriya, the Speaker, and also um, I think the wild card uh, could be uh, Minister Patli Champikaranavagar's name. Um, out of all these, who do you think going forward in terms of the party, in terms of the country, what kind of an administration would look better for the nation out of all those four names? Uh, I think, Mahesh, uh, the discussion should be centered around, uh, I mean, not around the names or the individuals. It's about the uh, alternatives and the programs of action uh, they bring to the table. Right. So the prime minister, uh, the prime minister, I think certainly he projects himself as a reformist. Now he will uh, ride on his legacy, especially uh, the RTI Act, 19th Amendment to the Constitution, independent commissions, and all these democratic reforms that he initiated under uh, under the current government uh, in 2015. But there are, I mean. Loose ends have to be tied up, uh, as Eranda mentioned. We all have to, have, for instance, constitutional council. Now, uh, it's a good step. It's a significant step in terms of depoliticizing the state sector, keep appointments in the state sector. But at the same time, there are certain uh, uh, things that need to be rectified. For instance, constitutional uh, council does not have a have a standard procedure when it comes to uh, selecting uh, names. Now, president may send a list of names mm -hmm. and the constitutional uh, yes. council fits around the town, round table and they you know make there, there's yep. no criteria against which they can measure uh, those mm -hmm. CVs so those things need to be rectified but still it's a greater it's a great step it's a significant step towards uh, democratizing or depoliticizing so your point of view uh, would be the fact that it 
Prime Minister Ranbir Vikram Singh is the best candidate. He will ride on that legacy. That is one aspect of the argument. And then someone like uh, Minister uh, Partly Champika Ranavakana, he hasn't explicitly said, stated that he is running for he's, he's running for the presidency, but he has offered a very solid program of actions in terms of uh, you know dealing with the challenges posed by the fourth industrial revolution and how to create a modern economy and things like that. So it it it, it lays the foundation for a very strong discussion on how the country should be governed in the next five years. Uh, Rasika, uh, these, this candidate, uh, Prime Minister Rani Vikram Singh, has been in power since 1994 and he, whatever he brings to the table right now, he should have showed in action during whatever the time that he has been doing it. What we've seen from the 2015 uh, election up until now is the fact that there is a complete um, Mis, uh, it's not a misinterpretation, uh, but more of uh, a misrepresentation of the promises that they've given to the public. Um, the people are not happy. Uh, if you go and speak to them and ask them about the, the, the current government's track record, you know that the words are going to be filthy that's coming out from most of their <laughs> mouths. So how can, in an environment like this, how can a, a prime minister been there for such a long period once again go to the public and say, hey, I'm going to give you this, 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 and these are my reforms. Back me up. Uh, <coughs> Mahesh, that's called incumbency fatigue. I mean, even President Rajapaksha experienced Indeed. that towards the latter part of his government now in 2014. Uh, uh, if my memory serves me right, uh, there was a, they ran an ad uh, on a giant screen at R. Premadasa Stadium, Subhanagatya advertisement, the run up to the election. And, uh, you know, the response from the crowd was not so good. Uh, it's quite similar to the recent incident. So it's called incumbency fatigue. It's a natural phenomenon in politics. However, yes, what you what you what you said is partly true. Now, Rani Vikram Singh, Mr. Rani Vikram Singh, has been uh, in power in the UNP for 25 years. But he has, uh, but on two occasions, he managed to uh, form governments. In 2001, December 2001, uh, he was in power as the prime minister under a seemingly hostile presidency, somewhat similar to the current situation, mm -hmm. uh, for two and a half years. And in 2015, uh, he managed to form a government, again, under different uh, president. But unfortunately, this time, 2015, the president was, uh, he was supposed to be uh, a non-partisan a president. I mean, during the campaign, no one said he's going to be the leader of the SLFP and uh, he was going to get in involved in uh, this toxic party politics in Sri Lanka. But unfortunately, two weeks after the election, the president uh, took over the SLFP and he aligned, with, aligned himself with the party and he spent all his energy and uh, uh, his energy on protecting the party leadership completely turning a blind eye to the uh, reforms that he promised. Mm -hmm. So these are unique situations. So to be in, in, in fairness to uh, the Prime Minister, I think uh, he never had uh, total control over the government he uh, he, he, he represented or he, he under which he served as the Prime Minister. Before we go uh, to a break, uh, even though you say that, the President himself says that he doesn't have control of the government because it's been taken over by the Prime Minister. And because of that, he can't do whatever he promised. Mm -hmm. And you are right now saying uh, that apparently it's because of the President. So let's say that going forward, in case if he takes the presidency or if he takes power of, of this particular uh, institution, what kind of an administration would it be? I mean, how, how different will it be from what, what we're experiencing right now? It's very clear, Mahesh, it has to be a stable government. And I don't think this uh, concept of, uh, the current concept of national government works in Sri Lanka, especially now during the election campaign 2014, uh, early 2015, President Sirisena and Prime Minister Vikram Singh have worked together and they were supposed to govern the country together. But uh, no one, I mean, Prime Minister didn't ask the President to go and take over the SLFP and engage in uh, party politics and pander to the needs of the SLFP MPs. But, but that's his prerogative. I mean, he has freedom to do that. I mean, he has right. freedom to do anything around there, but yeah. then he has to stick to the promises he gave to the people. Yeah. That's how... Uh, yeah, but I mean, in, I think what's happening here, Mahesh, is and, and we should not confuse... I mean, the people are confused. I mean, we, we expect the president, right, or the presidency 
to make huge changes uh, in reforms, uh, you know, through their manifestos or whatever is promised. But I mean, come on, the presidency is, is, is not a legislature, it's not a part of the legislature. The, the presidency cannot make laws to start with, right? The president can act within the laws that is being made by the legislature, which, which, are be, which had been made by the legislature so far. So the presidency is more about executing whatever his or her roles as part of the presidency. I think this is where we need to make our viewers understand, uh, Mahesh, that we should not expect unreasonable reforms and changes and, you know, grand, uh, you know, changes from just one institution, right? Actually, the the bulk of that decision making and, and reform should come from the parliament. Mm -hmm. That's the job of the parliament. That's why we need to elect a good set of people who actually read uh, the, the the amendments <laughs> and and uh, acts and bills before they even raise their hands, right? So that is more important, I think. But having said that, now, you know, going back to Rasika's earlier uh, point about that the president and the prime minister, as part of the executive maybe, as you, as you say, not as part of the legislature, need to have a good understanding. Then uh, in, in, that, in that argument, I think Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa and Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa will get along very well. Right? Yeah, because they're siblings. Yeah, because they're siblings. Yeah, exactly. because governments don't function like that. Yeah, right? right? But, but, but I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean these are the, the case, I mean, we are all adults and these are democratic institutions, yeah. right? You don't, you need not be, <laughs> you need not necessarily be a sibling to have a great understanding sure. with the... But, but this, in this case, it will work because they have a good, uh, good relationship. <laughs> Um, that's a very good uh, place to leave that conversation and take a so short commercial break. We'll be right back right here on Nuclear Status. Welcome back everyone to the program. Uh, tonight we are discussing with Erang the Guinea Gay and also Raska Jaikari uh, with regard to their presidential candidates and exactly what they would bring to the table um, if they get the power from the upcoming presidential election. I want to do a, a switcheroo here and ask from you Eranga, what would be, if, if it is a, a Prime Minister running Wickremesinghe as candidacy or whether it's Sajid Premadas as candidacy, what would be the most um, obstacles that they would face in, in bringing their message from an opposing point of view? Well, I think, um, I think a lot of people have lost trust um, in, in Mr. Ranil Wickremesinghe. You know, he has been, as you said, he has been, you know, a party leader for 25 years and, you know, I mean, it's, it's a very, very long time. Uh, and you know, from what we see, uh, at the, you know, that is happening in the UNP and has been happening in the UNP, you know, you know, although it's, it, it looks like disagreements and there's healthy democracy within the party. I mean, you know, it's it's one person holding this and sort of manipulating it. That's that's what we see, and I think people see that. So I think people have lost uh, trust and credibility in the person and, and you know you know sort of coming again and saying I'm going to give a, a gym set uh, to each village I mean these are you know people people don't believe these kind of things I mean these chewing gums and bracelets and free Wi-Fi and now the new newest thing is is a new gym set you know I mean pe people cannot be fooled like that anymore right uh, particularly the young people so I, th I think Ranil Vikramasinghe is is a, is a is really I mean if he's the candidate it's going to be you know a, a, a easy win. If I just j jump in right there and ask you, um, the younger crowd is like you said um, is going to be the deciding voters in this election as well. There is a, a marginal uh, amount sure. of people who's coming as the new voting block, and we will we will see that them they being. The ones who will finally decide as to who would the leader be uh, in, in a scenario like that uh, most of them might not know what Kutabe Rajpaksa did yes or for the country yes but that gym equipment might resonate <laughs> well with them well so, I, s I seriously hope not because I think I think that youth that we're talking about is not that ignorant you know they're exposed to internet you know they're on social media and they, they watch YouTube so I think I think they're not gonna be that ignorant uh, but the, the the need of, uh, of of the hour is to actually educate uh, by our camp 
and for them to be educated on on what the policies are and what is the legacy of of Mr. Gotabi Rajpaksa. Who he, is he really? You know, his 20 plus years of service uh, uh, in in the army. Why did he leave? You know, what, what 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 does he think about? What does he know about the state? You know, what are his what is his vision? What is his uh, economic vision? For, uh, socialist market based economy. They need to get educated, obviously, right? But I think. I think one of the things that Mr. Gotabe Rajpaksa always says is that he cannot give false promises. He cannot fool people like this. Mm -hmm. You know, he can't. He can't just you know say I'm going to build X number of houses. I'm going to give you this free. I'm going to give you this many number of jobs. And and and, and I mean, he's not such a person. You know, he's a, he's a very he's a very you know he's a truthful person. He will say what he can do, and then he he will promise that okay, this look here, guys, this is what I can do, and let me and I, I promise you I will be able to do that. He's not going to give false promises. Uh, Brasica, same question. In a Gotabe Rajapaksa candidacy, now as he start his campaign, what are the main challenges that he faces in in your point of view? Uh, the main challenge, it's very clear, the main challenge would be uh, the allegations that he has not uh, yet answered, for instance, why uh, there wasn't a comprehensive investigation into the murder of Lasanta Vikramatunga under his watch as the Defence uh, Minister Secretary. I mean, he was he was an important, he was the most important cog in the in the in the defence machinery under the previous government. And uh, uh, why didn't he uh, why uh, didn't he act in a transparent manner when it comes to uh, the the investigation uh, pertaining to the abduction uh, of uh, Keith Noya? Why wasn't there a comprehensive statement on the incident involving Mr. Palitendokon, who was assaulted uh, almost at his doorstep? So these these memories are still fresh, and Mr. Raja, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha will have to answer uh, to those concerns. He has he, he will have to respond to those concerns. So that's the main challenge. And then there's this sense of fear among the public that uh, uh, a possible Rajapaksha presidency, Gotabe Rajapaksha presidency will result in uh, a soft dictatorship in the country. Uh, the country will turn into a police state. So I don't see uh, this group, this camp addressing that uh, uh, concern adequately. Well, what do you mean by soft dictatorship? Uh, I mean, that's what we experienced before 2015. People suddenly, uh, journalists, you know, uh, being murdered on the street. Uh, journalists well, I mean, getting assaulted, uh, being assaulted at their so doorstep. So journalists getting assaulted, is that soft dictatorship? I mean, these are not isolated I mean, incidents. I mean, in, in, in the U.S. it gets, uh, it happens. Does that mean that the U.S. has soft dictatorship? And it what about the investigations? Yeah. When something happens in the U.S., sure. there's a machine, there, there, there's an institutional framework that allows yeah. uh, at least seemingly fair investigations. Yeah. And so what happened? And what happened to Lasanta Vikramatunga's notebook? These are the real. These are the real. How so? How does see, see, how does there, our institutional there, there framework? There are investigations. There are cases going right. Let the law pr l law take yeah, its course. These, right? these cases. I mean, these Rasika, investigations I think, I think started. I mean, these these kind of stories, Rasika. You know, this this these this was the script. You're just repeating the script that was uh, that. That, that everybody read in back in 2014. You know, you use Lasanta Vikramatunga whenever you want. I mean, for the last four and a half years, what happened to the investigation? You had so much time. Right? This, this, is this is nothing so about this. Is, time, okay, right? let, me, let me be very clear. This is nothing about the investigation. Investigations were uh, started after the current government came to power. But why is Mr. Rajapaksa silent about this incident? Well, why? So show me an instance where he has spoken about, he has spoken comprehensively about Lasanta Vikramatunga incident. See, see, Okay. Show me an instance where so he, he, he doesn't have. I mean, if when whenever he's required to do so, he would do it. But you know, I mean, why why would he? Ha you think over the past five years, I mean, yeah. past four and a half years, he didn't have a single instance where he had to step up and make a statement on these matters why, and why? clear the doubts of the people? Well, see, the, see, the doubts. If 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 I may interject here, okay, if if he make a statement, if he says, this is what it is. You think then that clears the whole thing and there wouldn't be any other challenges? It all depends on the state. First, he has to make a statement, Mahesh. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, I, 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 I I'm, I'm asking why hasn't see, he made a see, statement? It's, it's a very simple question. No, Rasika, anybody can make allegations, right? Anybody can accuse you. I can accuse you. You yeah. can accuse me. But it's, it's up right? to me to come no, up and present no, my version of no, the story. No, no, no. That's not how it works. That, that burden of proof is with the person who who brings the accusation, brings the allegation. So if you are making an allegation against me, I don't have to come and prove myself. 
right? If, if I haven't done it, I can just stay silent. I, that is my prerogative. That is my decision. You have the burden of proof as the person who brings the allegation to prove it, to show the evidence and to prove it in a, in, in a, in a proper uh, uh, case. So, you know, we go to Abhi Rajapaksa is not uh, bound to come and give statements like that. Why should he? All right. Um, let's turn to uh, policies of these two uh, camps and try to get an understanding of exactly what the administration would uh, look like. I will start with you around the... Hmm. Um, 2015, 2014, 2015, we saw a lot of promises made by the UNP-led uh, government uh, with regard to uh, an economic renaissance, if I may. Mm. Uh, they wanted to develop, there will be so much of foreign investment. Um, as we find, found out now, most of that did not take place. Yeah. So what kind of uh, Gotabe Rajpak's uh, administration-led economy will look like? Mm. What exactly can we expect? Mm. Are we going to expect the same kind of promises of X, Y, Z number of things, mm. or is it something more policy based? So I can I can sort of talk about. I mean, I don't want to give out too much <laughs> because it should come in the <laughs> manifest, right? But because I'm a, I'm a, a member of the executive committee of the Vietmag organization, which was set up quite some time back uh, uh, under the auspices and leadership of uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa to do exactly this, Mahesh. That is to come up with. I mean, it's a collective of professionals and you know intellectuals, educationists of, on, from various sectors, uh, and it's it's a free organization. Uh, it's it's to come up with policy. And, and plans for the future, right, under any gov gov government. So one of the most important things right now, actually, is, is to get our security, state security, back on track, right? That's like the number one priority in terms of policy or whatever, right? So because Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa has proven that he is capable of securing uh, the Republic uh, uh, and, and, and making our people safe again, right, um, safe in the past, it is very much uh, uh, believable that he, he can do it again, right? So I think his number one priority is to get our Republic's security back on track. Uh, and make the people feel safe again. That is number one. Because if you don't have that safety, then it, you know, let alone foreign investors, the local investors are not going to work. I mean, you you see this, right? The private sector is not functioning, right? So when that happens, obviously the private sector is going to come back. You know, the confidence is going to come back. So the economy will see a quick uh, boost uh, in in the early days of of Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa's presidency. There's no question about that. You know, whenever we hear about Mr. Rajapaksa, you know, in the, in the past, when we, whenever we heard Mr. Rajapaksa's uh, name coming up, you know, there was some boost in the stock exchange and so on. So, mm -hmm. and that's going to happen. Number two, in terms of economy, Mr. Rajapaksa, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa has presented a new economic vision, Mahesh, and it's called the socialist market-based economy, right? Now, this is a new economy that has been developing over the last 15, 20 years in the world. It's the best of the socialist uh, uh, economic principles, uh, having a, a social security for all people, but at the same time having the best of the, uh, the, the, the capitalist or the market-based economic principles, right? That is what we're seeing happening in, in places like China and India and in Russia. You know, that's where sort of everybody's moving. And this is where I quite like, and this is one of the reasons why I, Eran the Ginige, uh, is, is supporting uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa's presidency is because that is the that is the space where we can talk about concepts like social entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. universal basic income. You know, I mean, UBI is one of the main solutions uh, as as uh, the, the world economists predict for uh, the uh, issues in uh, uh, coming from the fourth industrial revolution, for example. So, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa is very much aware of of these global and regional and local issues, and 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 the people around him are very much uh, informed. I mean, I'm part of that policy making and I'm, I'm talking about this fourth industrial revolution social enterprise social innovation and he's such a great listener and absorber and he reads a lot he understands all of it and he wants to come up with a practical economic model that fits our 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 state, you know, I mean, we, we, we are not the US, we are not Singapore, we are not uh, uh, Malaysia, we are not China, we are not Beijing, we are Sri Lanka, right? So whatever the economic model that we build, it needs to be based on our strengths and our weaknesses, right? So he understands that very much. So I think that is where I think we will see a big difference when it comes to his economic principles compared to the previous governments. 
Uh, Rasika, still the candidate is yet to be named, but you said that it should not be seen, uh, you should not be just looking at the candidate, but what kind of policies and uh, development or strategies that they can bring to the table. So in a UNP-led administration, what is what kind of changes can we say economically? What are the things that will be different from what we are seeing right now? I think the main focus of the UNP's campaign, uh, the election manifesto, should be strengthening the institutional framework uh, of the country. Uh, as we all know, the institutional framework has become paralyzed. I don't want to blame it on a particular government, this government or the previous government. This happened over a long period of time, and now we have just reached a critical point in this, in this entire process. So it needs to be rectified. Look at it like a patient who is in dire straits. We need to perform an urgent surgery on the patient. And at this point, we are busy debating the names of doctors without paying due attention to the surgery that needs to be performed. And we need to pick the right doctor to perform the surgery. That's how it should be done. Uh, so in terms of the UNP, uh, UNP's way forward, uh, institutional framework, strengthening institutional framework, that is number one. In terms of economic policy, I think there's no big difference between what Eranda said and what we, I mean, we, we believe uh, in our uh, strategic, uh, strategic discussions because we believe that the uh, global economic center of power is more shifting towards, have already shifted towards the global east. So that will be uh, a key. But, but, key. but then that kind of contradicts with the UNP's economic model of aligning yourselves with the, with the West and particularly the US, like, you know, you know, like for example, the Millennium Challenge Cooperation Agreements, that kind of stuff. Uh, now, around the Millennium Challenge Agreement, it, I mean, it was first pursued by uh, Mr. Rajapaksha's government. Mi uh, uh, so this is the Millennium, Millennium Challenge. You're talking about SOFA, I think. No, yeah, no. It, it, Millen it, it, Millennium it, Challenge in 2014, if my no, memory serves me right. Uh, agreement and then I don't think it's a Millennium Challenge. Millennium Challenge 2007, is that, is the, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is the EXA, exa agreement. Mm -hmm. yeah. 2014, if my memory serves me right, uh, the previous government also pursued this path, but it didn't work out. The discussions didn't move forward, right? And then this is a continuation sure of the same of the same process. So, I mean, when it comes to global players, sometimes the interests overlap, right? That's how this game works. You have to work with China, you have to work with the US, you have to work with the UK, you have to work with the global East, you have to work with India. So all these players have different and conflicting strategic interests. Now, Sri Lanka, we have to understand one thing, Mahesh, because in politics, in foreign policy, there are no friends. There are no friends. No one will, no one will, you know, uh, extend the hand of friendship. Or there, there's no free lunch. So we need to manage these various factors, and we need to make sure that where I mean, we need to have a clear idea as to where we stand in the equation. So that's what Mr. Vikramasinghe will bring into the table. I mean, although he's often projected as a as a as as, as a liberal or neoliberal. Uh, I mean, liberalism doesn't e neoliberalism doesn't exist in the world. It's dead and gone, Nera. Oh, come on. Right. You know, in the US <laughs> not really, not the really. Yeah, not, not really. You know, I think we need to go in for a short commercial <laughs> break. Uh, we will be right back on Get Real Estate Bus. to the program. Uh, we're discussing with Eran the Ginike and also Rasika Jayakuri with regard to their presidential candidates and exactly what kind of uh, an administration we can hope for as we go on. Very quickly, Rasika, uh, Eran, the, uh, I want to get your reaction to the education system in this country. Uh, one of the things that uh, Dr. Parkis Soti Sarvanamuthu in, in our previous program raised was the fact that we are building a financial hub here. Uh, the port city is going to be a viable city that is going to come within the next decade. So when that comes in and, and we will see lots of jobs created in this. But our education system is not geared to allow a person to get a job in that financial city. So what, how can you address that? I mean, the UNP and I think all political parties, all major political parties for that matter, uh, believe in strong educational reforms. I mean, Sri Lanka is in dire need of strong, comprehensive education reforms. For instance, there's an unbridgeable skill gap between what is produced by the students who are produced by the state education system and 
the requirements of the dynamic uh, job market. Uh, for instance, none of the Sri Lanka, none of the, I think, the large majority of uh, the students produced by the local education system will not be suitable, will not be uh, deemed suitable by global players who will be investing in the, in, the, in, the, in the financial city. So they'll have to rely on either foreign graduates or they'll, they'll, have, to out, they'll have to look outwards. Right? This is not a sustainable system. So the, uh, the UNP, or any party that comes to power in Sri Lanka will have to embark upon serious educational reforms, especially the curriculum. Everything has to be completely reformed to suit the um, challenges, to meet the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution and the dynamic and the new changes that are happening across the world. So that is a that is that is, that is a very essential. Uh, Aaron, your take on it, if by any chance you know. Um if we can't generate the number of people to get jobs in a city like that, why, why even create it? I mean, no argument. We have to uh, update our education system and you know, such changes were done in, in, during the Mahindra Rajapaksa's um, government, uh, such as you know, technology streams and uh, uh, Mahindra uh, Vidyagaras and you know, laboratories and so on. So, but. But I think it is it is very slow, right? I think it needs to be some radical change in the whole system, particularly in the higher education system. I think well. the two main parties should be on well, the same so page. So this is one yeah. area where I think the UNP and the SLPP can work together. You know, the parliamentarians should have a common vision yeah. on on a transforming education, uh, and and in, you know not just uh, you know making employable uh, citizens, but also civic-minded citizens. I mean, this is something that I'm very passionate about. I mean, teaching people of, of basics of the Constitution and how to make decisions and how to act as a citizen in the Republic, such kind of things are also in The idea of social responsibility. Social responsibility and so on. So, so all these are very much part of Mr. Gotabi Rajapaksa's policy plan. And it's not just Mr. Gotabi Rajapaksa, it's also uh, Sri Lanka Pudujana pa uh, Paramuna Party uh, uh, sort of plans. So, yeah. Seems like we have come to an agreement, finally, <laughs> <laughs> about the education system. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, uh, Eranda uh, Ginigay, who is a social entrepreneur and also uh, is part of the We Help Manga program, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and also Raske Jaikari, uh, uh, a political activist and also a political commentator. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining uh, in this program. It has been a pleasure. I'll be right back with my closing arguments. In my closing argument, it's indeed true that we as a nation need to look at the policies and strategies of the candidates rather than pure names. Like Rasika said, it will be that factor that will carry us as a nation towards growth. However, this time, the call by the masses genuinely is for Mr. Gotabe Rajpaksa. That call heightened with the April 21st attacks after the country was thrown back to chaos, a country that was enjoying freedom. Now, both camps will begin to educate the masses on their policies and what their vision for this country is. I absolutely agree with Aranda when he said that giving bracelets and chewing gum to the public once again is not going to help us all and that it's not the job of the executive to provide those incentives, but give the vision to the country that it needs in order to take us to the next level. We're still trying to be a Singapore, while according to the International Monetary Fund, in 2018, Singapore was the 34th strongest economy in the world, while Sri Lanka was at the 64th position. So in a way, we are halfway there. Now it's vital that we collectively think as to which candidate can take us to the top. We need to make that decision thinking about a candidate that will fight for the country, fight for us, and more importantly, fight for each and every Sri Lankan and not just the top brass. I want to leave you tonight with a quote from an ancient Greek philosopher, Plato, who figured this simple truth way back in 429 BC. He said, one of the penalties for refusing to participate in politics is that you end up being governed by idiots. Ain't that the bitter truth? Well, that's it for this week. I'm Mahesh Johnny from all of us here at the Other Dharana and the Get Real team. Have a very good night. I'll see you next week. Thank you.